about ready for our next speaker. Um, so I'm ashamed to say that I don't know much at all about web components. <laughs> uh, so I'm really hoping that our next speaker, Cassandra, can change all of that. Um, this will be a very useful session for me. So I only just found out from her talk description that there was such a thing as the light DOM. Like, I know that's a shadow DOM. I was like, oh. That's a thing I probably should know about. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I hopefully that will all change in the next 40 minutes. Um, so Cassandra is a design systems engineer at Adobe and a member of the CSS working group. And she fell in love with CSS uh, through GeoCities and styling MySpace pages. So um, I'm sure her and Sophie will have a lot in common there. <laughs> and probably many of you as well. Uh, so please welcome Cassandra. Right, um, I just want to ask, speaker notes? Sorry, we didn't have it in between to set up. <laughs> um, I don't have the speaker note view for the animations. All right, uh, so I'm hoping to demystify a few things for you about web components. Um, as um, was stated, I am Cassandra Roberts, and here we go. Uh, you may know me from the interwebs as Castastrophe <laughs> in the open source world. What I care deeply about is creating positive user experiences on the web. I believe the web is for everybody. Full stop, no exceptions. My way of contributing to this work is through the design system space. First at Red Hat, and now I'm at Adobe. Though I kind of started out as a hobbyist, I'm sure like many of you, I didn't really know that there was a job where you could write CSS all day. Uh, that was pretty cool when I found that out. And I finally found my way to this very rewarding and very challenging career. And that career led me to Web components. And if you'll uh, beg my uh, just a, a moment of indulgence, I would like to just a quick shout out to a few mentors and supporters. I would not be here without them. Uh, Kyle Buchanan, with his amazing humor and infinite patience, uh, he taught me everything that he knew about web components. JavaScript guru. He's a very talented developer and an incredibly compassionate manager at Red Hat. Mark Karen was a creative and completely innovative front-end genius. Uh, together with Kendall Totten, he and I, we pushed deep into custom properties at their very infancy to figure out how they could serve as a theming system for our components. And this approach has become a standard among fellow web component themers. And that collaboration is something that I have found deeply rewarding. Kendall Totten, a true unicorn. She taught me everything she knew about design systems. She's clever, she's tenacious, and she tackles every task with thoughtful analysis and was always just my favorite person to whiteboard component architecture with. And Michael Clayton, my husband, but also my colleague for eight years at Red Hat. He has talked through ideas and groundbreaking concepts with me for countless hours. And he's an incredible developer whom I'm very grateful to have also as a partner in life. And give yourselves a round of applause because I would not be standing here today if you were not open to this topic and had an interest in it. So thank you. <laughs> but wait, are web components really a thing? So you know I worked at Red Hat and Adobe. Some of the other big tech companies that are using web component libraries are Microsoft, IBM, Google, Apple. 
ING is absolutely a thought leader in this space as a Salesforce. Have you ever used GitHub, Netlify, GitLab? Just web components all the way down. And here are a few other companies that are leveraging web components. Anyone Wordle today? Legit web components. Like My personal favorite, though, space. Yo, web components have literally gone to space. Freaking awesome. All right, before we dig in, I'm just going to do a little logistics. Uh, because when we're talking about the various contributors and consumers of web components, it can get really confusing because these roles overlap in an incestuous Venn diagram. So in this presentation, I'll be referring to people who build web components as developers and the consumers of those web components as authors. Authors use web components to build a website, but they don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of the web component. And at the end of the funnel is the user. This is a person that we are all working for and that we want to make uh, an incredible experience for, and we hope that engages with our content. All right, now code. Today I'm going to focus on autonomous custom elements written in vanilla JavaScript, and this is going to keep us close to our fundamentals without injecting opinions from libraries uh, about structure or syntax, and it just is going to keep us focused on styling web components. That said, I would highly recommend that you use libraries such as Lit in your production projects. Uh, the improvements to the developer experience, the future forward features, they're highly tuned into the specifications with the goal of making themselves obsolete. Uh, and the strong communities and well-written documentation that exists for many of these libraries, not just Lit, is really hard to beat. What we don't have covered, time to cover today is going to be event listeners or callbacks. Uh, but I, I have linked to some resources in the appendix and some of my own personal descriptions. Um, so you're welcome to check that out after the um, conference. And there wasn't time to deep dive on the nuances of styling and, and cover the entire life cycle of the web component at the same time. So I don't know, maybe next year. <laughs> okay, so let's start our adventure. You all buckled in? All right. In the beginning, beginning, beginning. There was HTML, and it was good, right? Fast forward a billion or so seconds, and the landscape of web development looks a lot different. <laughs> Options abound for setting up our technical stacks, and frameworks are 10 a penny. For a long time, the MVC pattern struggled to take hold in JavaScript. There was a strong need on the web for two-way data binding and componentization, especially for complex UI libraries. Enter web components. Web components is a term that is used to describe a very specific set of web specifications. The cornerstone to web components is the custom element registry. So this is how we register our elements to the page. It's an instance that contains a record of what we've defined and in what state those components exist. So several methods exist on your registry. that You can add to it, you can update it, and you can check on it. Uh, to see what's been defined for use in the DOM. A quick tip, it's going to save you hours of debugging, I promise. You cannot redefine the same element in the registry. You'll throw a DOM exception, and you just need to be very aware of what elements are being defined in your document, and take some steps to prevent it. Uh, typically, I wrap every definition in a registry check first to make sure I'm not throwing this exception. All right, custom elements fall into two categories, custom built-ins and autonomous elements. And they look like this. Custom elements use the is keyword and the traditional p tag versus autonomous elements, which have their very own flavor and style. So a little bit about customized built-ins. They're extensions of existing HTML instances, and this means that you are starting from the current specification for a tag, like a paragraph element, and you're just building on top of it. So this can be tricky because you need to be aware of the existing styles for that element in the browser, but on the flip side, you get all the browser defaults for that tag. <laughs> you can only attach a shadow DOM, and we'll talk more about that later, to certain 
uh, components, and this is for security reasons. You can't, for example, attach a shadow DOM to a, a form link or a, a link tag. Uh, this could lead to some really serious data leak, so it's no good. And no go, it won't let you do it. Uh, but you won't have the benefit of encapsulation in those cases. So even without encapsulation, though, you do get the inherent benefits of leveraging a browser element that most closely matches the semantics that you're trying to achieve. So my advice, if you're considering leveraging customized built-ins, which are pretty awesome, uh, do keep them very simple and know your polyfill options very well. There are some excellent polyfills out there, uh, but the WebKit team has indicated that this part of the specification will not be implemented. So easily, the most common type of web component is the autonomous custom element, and this is the one you've probably seen the most. These elements inherit from your HTML base class and are written to the page as their very own tag. So when defining autonomous elements, you must define the functionality entirely yourself. This includes accessibility considerations, like semantic attributes, keyboard navigation, and your focus state management. So when you're registering your autonomous custom elements, uh, you have to map your class name to your desired tag name. These tags must include a dash, which makes it easier for the browser to quickly parse out elements in the DOM that are custom versus built-in. Most UI libraries that are built on custom elements use a namespace value as that first part of the tag, just to simplify the naming. <laughs> because, you know, let's be honest, like 50% of our jobs is like naming things. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's the good stuff. Next up, this is our entry point to styling web components. And quite possibly, I think, the most well-named part of the web component specification. Uh, I mean, who doesn't love saying and talking about the shadow DOM? Oh, I put it in the shadow DOM. It's in the shadow DOM. Backwards. It really likes that animation. OK. It evokes this imagery for me of vigilante web developers who are out there building tags on their own terms, and they're answering to no committees, and they're writing their own rules. The terrors that code in the night. It's a Darkwing Duck reference. So a web component with no shadow DOM is styled globally like every other element on your page. So by attaching a shadow DOM, you're creating a new separate DOM just for the markup and styles that you want to attach. This means any styles that you attach will not have any influence over anything in your original DOM tree. All alone. <laughs> but I mean, we all want total and complete isolation, right? It's, it's been good. So what does it all mean? This means that we don't have to use any more fancy naming class methodologies. No more specificity wars. No more desperately hoping that your documentation about semantics and ARIA use is followed correctly in production. <laughs> Encapsulation means that you, as a builder of components, have complete control over the entire user experience. This also makes altering and enhancing the semantic structure of your element a snap, too, because <laughs> a simple version bump in your, production, in your code uh, can include a complete restructuring of the shadow DOM in your component, potentially without the authors having to alter a single line of markup. A great example of this is the navigation component that we built at Red Hat as part of the Patternfly Elements project. What, what? Throughout their diverse ecosystem of sites, many with their own sub-brands, Red Hat wanted to provide a unified experience for their users. With disparate and often geographically separated teams, enforcing correct usage of the system and getting all the implementations to use the appropriate semantic elements was challenging. So this bad boy, this navigation, <laughs> It accepts custom content and theming, but it enforces the placement and interaction of the items. It has light DOM, shadow DOM, fallback markup, fallback styles, just in case the JavaScript doesn't load. I mean, it's a pretty critical part of their site, so if this seems over-architected, it totally is. <laughs> but with really good reason. So to upgrade this experience, fix bugs, 
alter the semantic DOM because, you know, your understanding of what's right and what's wrong changed. Developers can instruct authors to, hey, bump to the latest version and test the update in your architecture, just to be sure. The component requires no author changes as long as the developer maintains that API. If you break the API, it is really important with this approach that you communicate the upcoming deprecation and publish it under a breaking change. Since your web component is encapsulated from the root tree, certain CSS best practices don't have to apply. I mean, I was really surprised when I started working on web components how much of my job up until then had been focusing on protecting styles I'd written from rogue legacy properties. If you can imagine Red Hat as this giant ecosystem, we had legacy code that had been written in 95. <laughs> Since the web component exists in a separate DOM, you can safely leverage IDs, tags, any attribute you want in your style sheets. A lot of projects tag style sheets or styles to IDs in their shadow templates just for readability, simplicity, and a little bit of efficiency gain, especially with your query selectors. This also means that your styles can be attached directly to elements with semantic significance, such as forms or buttons. Similarly, you don't have to create a separate class for every semantic concept that you're styling for. It has state represented in the component, then just tack your styles directly to that. Single source of truth. The name of the game is to know yourself, though, and know your community. So decide what shortcuts you want to make use of and discard the rest. All right, so let's look at one component built three different ways. And there's a lot of ways, but we're going to look at three. <laughs> All right, meet Card. He's a bit needy. He really wants to be loved. What are some ways that we can break down this visual into a web component? So here we have a vanilla web component outline. It fetches a button that's nested inside a component, and it does some JS stuff to it. It's not attaching a shadow DOM, and there's no template. What does the author experience look like? So the author uses the card tag with three children, and that builds this experience, a heading, a paragraph, and a button. Our web component would only handle what's supposed to happen when you click the Like Me button. Basically, it's a fancy div. In this approach, the web component is providing all the content as well as the semantics. This is an approach for tight control, and it means uh, it's a way to update your content under the hood. I actually really hate this approach <laughs> because <laughs> it means that if you want to fix a typo, you have to open a pull request. <laughs> so maybe include a content service that fetches the content from an API. <laughs> but, you know, what does it look like for the author? Ooh, that's very low effort. If this component supports little to no customizations, you can go bonkers rearranging the shadow DOM dramatically with this approach. All right, so this is the one you're probably most familiar with. In this approach, the author uh, experience is the same as the one we just saw, but in this, it's adding a template and it's attaching a shadow DOM. This is probably closer to what you've seen. There are so many ways to structure a web component, and they all allow you to accomplish different goals. So you need to find the method that works best for you and the problem that you're trying to solve. All right, now let's We've seen an example of Shadow DOM. Let's consider what the browser is seeing. At the start, we have our document tree. It's going along, minding its own business. Wham! Shadow host gets appended. The shadow host is the node that the Shadow DOM gets attached to. This host connects the shadow root, which is the root node of the shadow tree. All right, these two are brothers from another mother. All of this shadow goodness is constrained by the shadow boundary. And this is where the shadow DOM ends and the regular DOM begins again. And here, we see the flattened tree. And this is what you'll end up seeing in DevTools and ultimately what the browser is rendering. So, 
several pseudos exist uh, to target elements of a web component or represent state. Elements can exist in several states. Uh, they can be undefined, they can be failed, they can be custom, but if it's in an uncustomized or a pre-customized state, it's considered defined. I've seen some really impl interesting implementations that set up some really graceful fallbacks, so that if your web component doesn't upgrade within a certain number of seconds, uh, you can load some alternative style sheet. You can also use this to combat any jarring reflow issues that might occur when your component upgrades. All right, and now our powerhouse, host. Host and host context are pseudos that only work inside of the shadow DOM. They have absolutely no meaning in your original DOM tree. Throw something on host in your original DOM tree and it's gonna do nada. So host offers us a way to apply styles to the custom element from within the web component shadow DOM. So not unlike actually styling on the tag name itself. It's also one of the most important utilities for applying styles based on attributes as, uh, that an author has added to the tag. So it's kind of your way of communicating with the author. This is how developers can create um, context and variation for components by allowing authors to opt into visual or functional enhancements. This is also the only set of styles outside of slots, which we'll dive into soon, that has to compete with external styles. The host pseudo functions can accept any compound selects as input, and its focus is on determining if its host node matches those criteria. And if it does, those styles get applied. Host context is a pseudo that lets you define styles based on the context in which the web component exists. So in this example, our web component is receiving styles uh, only if it exists within a context that has a certain dark bean class on it. Host context has very sparse support, though, and is not likely to be implemented in Firefox or Safari. So when the host pseudo is used in the shadow DOM style sheet, it applies styles to the host node, aka the tag that exists in the original DOM. So any styles applied to host are competing against external styles. All right, to the code pen, Jeeves. Make sure it's on the right screen. There we go. Ah, awesome. I love it. Okay. Going to do some fun live codingness. Um, all right. So first up, we'll take a look at our structure. And let's see. Is this a good size? Yeah. All right. You don't really care about the visual right now. So we have our component. X component, and it has several slots, slot one, slot two, and a default slot. And this is what our author has put together. So let's hop over. We're going to skip the author styles, and we're going to hop over to our web component. What did we build? All right, so first up, apologies, this is in lit. It's a demo I built before making this presentation. Um, so here's our styles. First up, we've got some styles on our host to give it a general flex layout, some padding, basically make it look like a card. And we've got some H3 styles for some headings that are going to describe the content that's inside the slots, and some slot styles. Uh, a special note here, slots actually don't have a display. They, you have to assign it if you want them to actually have, otherwise, their content. So um, I am actually giving the slot space and style in this, in this example. And then we've got some styles on our slots. So we've got an outline around slot one, slot two, and here is the good stuff. All right, Let's see if my little pointer works. Ah. Okay, uh, first child. So here, when we read this, I imagine what it sounds like is, oh, okay, slot one for my first child assigned to slot one, I want it to have an orange underline, right? Okay, and for the last child in slot one, I want it to have a yellow underline. Okay, that makes sense. All right, slot two, same thing. First child, last child, okay. 
Uh, generic slot, okay, default slot, right? Okay, first child, text color red. All right, last child, text color blue. So let's see what actually happened. Womp womp. I don't actually see any underlines. Where'd the underlines go? Now we've got color, but it's not really where I'd expect it to be. Uh, I'm sorry, didn't I say blue was last child and red was first child? Like, here's my default slot. Shouldn't this be red? Shouldn't this guy be, be blue? All right, what's going on here? Well, cursor, there you are. Okay, so let's look back at what the author did. The author, they don't know what the shadow DOM looks like. They don't know what styles I wrote for it. They've never seen the inside of my web component. So they said, hey, I got my slot. I want this content in slot one, cool. I want this content in slot two. Oh, you know what, uh, this one, semantically, you know, my, my content makes sense together in these order. So, oh yeah, it's coming out this way and this way. Oh, and here's my light DOM, cool. They don't really care how I'm rendering it, and maybe I changed the way I was rendering it after they wrote this markup. So what's happening here, and what we're seeing with first child, last child, and this is an important thing with slots, is that it's actually targeting the first child in the light DOM. It's referencing the light DOM relationship that they have to each other. <laughs> it doesn't care about the relationship that they have within the slot. There's actually not a selector for that right now. TBD. Uh, but they're, they're actually targeting the relationship that they have to each other in the author's light DOM. So this is a really important thing to note. When you're talking about pseudos that describe the relationship of elements to each other, it's not going to be relevant to the relationship they have that in the, the shadow DOM template that you've built. So keep, keep that in mind, because you don't have control over how your authors use your slots. All right. Now we're going to see if I can go right back into my slideshow. <gasps> oh, when technology works, it really works, y'all. OK, so this is what the designer wanted. And this is what the designer ended up getting. Did I just show you guys? I showed you guys the wrong. Ah, oh, I just walked through the wrong demo. Ah. <gasps> OK. I really thought it was supposed to be the slot one. I do really like the slot one. It's kind of my favorite. We'll go back to CodePen. We'll just do both code pins all at once. This is what I get for having both tabs open. But yeah, that is one of my favorite code pens, because like, what on earth? OK. Oh, it's our card. It's our card, buddy. Good. All right, this is what I meant to show you. Um, but, but all good. All right, so we're going we're gonna to ignore what our implementers wanted to do. So all right. This looks like what our designer had spec'd out. They said, oh, I got this awesome card. It's going to be hot pink. And yes, I'll talk to them about the accessibility implications of like those two colors not really going together and being readable. Um, but you know, they're having fun. They're like, oh, it's going to be pink. And, uh, and then like, oh, well, you know, if they add the fun attribute, like they really want to get silly with it, then we'll make it purple. All right, cool, 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 cool. Um, great. So here's the card, and it's got your content, and it's rendering great. OK, so which card do we want to click? More fun or just kind of fun? More, more fun? You guys are my kind of people. <gasps> They like me better. OK. So if we go over here, we implemented exactly what the designer had asked us to do. We said, all right, here's my host. Background color, hot pink. Cool, cool. Text. Kind of give it some card styling. That's cool. All right. Oh, when it's in a fun context, all right, let's make it purple. That's cool. Some slot styles, which we'll get into later. Fancy is thrown in there for you for fun. Um, last of type, you know. Yeah. Um, styling our slot as an object. So we've, we've got some nice flex grow and, and push that like button all the way to the bottom. And then some styles on our button to make it look like a little Pinterest like button. Yeah. OK. And then for our template, all we have is a slot and a button. So that's it. 
All right, so let's see. It gets handed to the implementation team, and they don't even know the name of the design system team. They're just like under the gun, like, oh my god, I gotta get this deadline met. Ah, they wanted it yesterday, I'm so late. Okay, oh, well, the boss says, you know what? Hot pink, no. No, I want goldenrod. And you know, I'm the fun kind of dude. Who wants gray? Gray is my kind of fun. So here, the developer's like, all right, I gotta do this like yesterday. Um, I'm just gonna like attach some styles to the card. All right, here they go. And the boss also says, you know, that font, that, that heading, it's too big. It's too big. I want it to be smaller and no border. That's too fancy. We're not fancy. So they get rid of the border and they get rid of the larger font. And then for the button, he's like, oh, I want it to be red because, you know, it needs to be red. And so the, the developer, he says, okay. He puts, well, the author, sorry. The author puts red on his button. He's like, oh, that's not working. Why isn't that working? Uh, I'll just add bang important. That's probably it. It's probably specificity. That's still not working. Hmm. Okay, well, let's see where our button is. Hmm. <gasps> yep, it's tucked away safely in our shadow DOM. And it's not in the light DOM. The H3 is in the light DOM. No styles worked. Got your P tag in the light DOM. No button. So the authors don't have access to the button styles, unless you choose to add some customizations. But they do have access to everything else. So it's something to keep in mind. Let's go back to our presentation. And all right, here's what we've got, minus the heading, which I changed later. All right, so the moral of the story is that outside styles will always win over styles defined against a pseudo host. So your author is in the driver's seat. And this can be a really good thing or a bad thing. It depends on your community and your goals. It can serve as another way for authors to provide customizations. Yay! Alternatively, you can reject author control entirely and just skip a host at all. Just tack in a wrapper div inside of your shadow DOM and my precious. So alternatively, um, your author could say, cool, uh, I'm just gonna throw bang important on all my tag styles and guess what? You're out of luck. <laughs> um, so even if you throw bang important on all of your host styles, then they're gonna throw bang important on their styles and we're back to the wars again. All right. Custom properties. This is what everyone gets excited about with web components. <laughs> At least I, I get excited about it. Uh, so this is a cornerstone for projects who want open-ended customizations. These cascade down into your shadow tree and they are said to pierce the shadow DOM. Like, seriously top-notch naming <laughs> with some of this stuff. Uh, along with typography, these are part of an elite set of properties that can get passed through the shadow boundary, and this is why they have become absolutely critical to design customization. If you're a project that wants to offer an accessible and interactive experience via a web component, but you don't necessarily have strong opinions about the color of your button and the size of your border radius, custom properties are the answer. They allow you to create a hook. So these properties can be generic and apply to many parts of your shadow template or to a specific property for a single tag. You can pass information around a component and push it all the way down to nested shadow DOMs. Yeah, it gets really bonkers with some of these nested shadow DOMs. You can leverage the natural flow of the cascade though, and that's what's important. In a lot of ways, you're offering a consistently named concrete set of custom properties for your library. It's kind of like giving them a paintbrush. You're saying you can apply some pretty major sweeping changes to your site if they just update a few choice custom properties. And then they watch all the web components on their page update in unison. It's actually a really beautiful thing. Red Hat did a complete brand redesign and all we had to do was load a new theme. Your custom property values can represent scale, context, state, or branding and be woven into every web component in your library. The less, the more powerful. 
So keep in mind, this is technical debt. Be thoughtful. <laughs> in a lot of ways, it is an API. And if you're committing to these variable names and applications, they need to remain consistent unless you communicate a breaking change. You can also just tell your authors hands off. These are unstable, but I've seen that done, and I can tell you in large companies, it's never worked. <laughs> Those are just too shiny and too delicious to ignore. So this is an example from Spectrum Design Systems web component for card. In this component, the host applies a set of styles, a few of which reference custom properties with names that are scoped specifically to that card component. In turn, those variables are mapped to global properties, which can be sourced from a set of theme files. Some are specific to color, like if you wanted to load a dark theme, and some are specific to scale, such as loading a large scale for certain mediums and smaller scales for others. Remember when I said that web components were encapsulated? Yeah, I meant that they were mostly encapsulated. So these are 36 properties that actually have access to your Shadow DOM. They're heavily typographical settings, which is actually really handy, because you don't have to redefine your font settings in every single component on your page. I'm going to say that again. Please do not redefine your font settings in every single component on your page. It drives me nuts. I beg you not to do it, because it is a really beautiful thing to drop a component into different contexts and watch it just blend in seamlessly. I've teased you with some references and some examples using slots, including like a, a pre-demo that you guys got to do early. So if Shadow DOM offers us encapsulation, what is Light DOM? Light DOM is a way that we can describe markup that exists as a child of a custom element tag. You can pass this markup and content into a web component via slots. If you are leveraging Shadow DOM, you have to opt into using Light DOM by incorporating slots in the template. So slots can either be custom named or just the default. Slots represent a placeholder inside your web component where the author can just inject markup or content. So though the author can put as many nested children as they want inside your web component and inside the slot, you will only be able to access, as a web components developer, the assigned node from your CSS. So the assigned nodes are the direct descendants of the web component tag. Grandchildren might exist, but as far as the styles in your Shadow DOM are concerned, you are excommunicated. Keep this in mind when you've got P tags, because what goes inside of a P tag? Oh, strong, emphasis, A tags, those are grandchildren. They are not direct descendants. You cannot style them from inside your slot. All right, so how do we set up these slots in our web component templates? There is a shiny new tag specifically for this purpose called slot. Every element that your author nests inside your web component gets assigned and rendered inside the default slot, or the first slot example here. So to separate out multiple slots or to require authors to opt in to leveraging a slot, you can add names to the slot tag in your template. So this lets you break up your complex components into regions. Really great for layout. So having been on both sides of the web component work, developer and author, I can say I very much enjoy the authoring experience of the slotted content. It lets you, the author, focus on the semantics of your content rather than where the layout uh, of it will appear. I'm a big fan of web components as layout templates for structured content. To apply your content to the default slot, just add it as a child of the tag. And to assign it to a specific element, you fetch the name of the slot from the template and assign it with your tag to your tag with slot, slot equals. You can see that here, slot equals heading, slot equals favorite. You can assign as many elements as you want to a tag. You can have multiple slot equals to the same tag. Uh, or you can create a wrapper and then assign your elements as children to the assigned node. 
The first approach lets developers provide some styling assistance. So they might add like styles for your p tags or styles for, um, I don't know, your button. Uh, but the second approach actually separates your markup entirely. So it gives you two different hooks. Um, OK, styling slots is done using a slotted pseudo. There's a lot of pseudos in Web Components. Uh, slotted can be passed any attribute or tag, but note that it cannot access the children, like we said, beyond that first assigned node. It's really important because that has tripped me up so many times. <laughs> My mental trick is to um, imagine slots as pointers. So they point to markup in the original DOM, but not sets of markup. They can only hold that first assignment node in their list. The browser will render the nested children, but you can't influence them from inside. Slotted can leverage open-ended generic styles, such as setting styles for all the p tags in any slot. Or you can apply styles to content inside a specific slot by targeting the slot equals attribute. You can also apply blanket styles to every single element in a slot using star. Another way of targeting slots uh, that are named is to reference their name equals from the shadow DOM and query it for specific content inside of that slot. One thing I've always liked about Web Components is how many different ways we can get the same things done. That drives some people crazy, but I really like it. OK, now let's have fun. Uh, that's the bonkers example I already showed you that was going to be inserted here. But it was pretty fun, even though we got to see it early. Uh, it's from a code pen, and uh, I've used it to demonstrate how like, random order in your light DOM uh, can influence the structure of your styles. OK, let's talk about the parts specification. So parts offers authors access to apply any styles at all, any CSS property that they want to designate uh, that they want to apply to a designated section in the template inside the shadow DOM. So it leverages uh, parts. Uh, you want to, to, sorry, excuse me, to leverage parts effectively, you want to require a certain amount of foreknowledge uh, for the author. So you want to make sure it's well documented so that they understand what the shadow DOM looks like as they're assigning their part styles. This is a method that would likely need a ton of documentation and be designed specifically for a community of authors that are also web component developers themselves. So part names act really similarly to classes. You can have multiple elements with the same name or a single element with multiple part names. It's kind of nice to be able to mix and match. And a lot of times what I've seen parts used as in, in that fashion is to provide uh, kind of readable state. You can read like, oh, this is you know these two things. So here's an example from Spectrum Tabs web component. And apologies, this is also leveraging lit syntax. Like I said, production code typically uses some libraries. Um, so this tab list wrapper here is assigned a part attribute, part equals tab list. And this now opens up the entire section to any CSS property, not just custom properties, any CSS property. <laughs> so while custom properties can let you open up specific design concepts and serve more as a controlled leak, think of parts as the flood. Any and all customizations are allowed within the region. So here is parts in use uh, for the documentation site uh, for Spectrum Web Components. In this case, they're accessing the customizable part and setting their own overflow logic for specific to the documentation site. All right, a little unsolicited advice, but I guess you guys did technically invite me here. So uh, <laughs> as you begin building out your web component API, please do not use any of the global attribute names linked here uh, unless you are specifically using them as intended. So this can have really surprising and unexpected consequences. For example, imagine if you're trying to build an API where the author adds a style equals dark. Yeah, dark is not valid CSS. So that's going to cause some errors. All right. How on earth do we get our styles into the web component in the first place? Holy buckets. Y'all, there's so many ways to do this. 
and they all have their own pros and cons. I'll just cover a fraction of the most common ways because we don't have an eternity to be here talking about how to style inject. All right, several utility languages like lit provide tools that make writing CSS for web components easier. So for example, uh, I've worked on several projects where the HTML and the CSS live in distinct files so that your VS code can actually parse the content as it is supposed to be parsed, rather than inside of a template string, which is annoying. And if you've ever had to work on web components where you have to write styles inside of a template string, bug your like, developer and tell them fix that crap, because you shouldn't have to do that. You can import it from CSS. There's a ton of tools. NPM install something. Um, so most of them will output the compiled result as a style tag inside your shadow DOM with just vanilla CSS. So if you inspect in the um, dev tools, what you'll see is just style, content. So many browsers will implement an actual optimization for the style tags uh, that are either cloned from a common node, multiple web components of the same type, or have identical text. So this means that they are sharing a single backing sheet. And with this optimization, the performance of external and internal styles should be pretty similar. All right, so here we have uh, pretty much the same thing. It's, it's importing. It's a style tag, and it's importing from a URL. What do you think the problem is here? <laughs> Massive flash of unstyled content. It's going to be bonkers, unless you have like the fastest connection known to man. So if you're going to use an approach like this, um, you want to make sure that you have thought about what you want to happen when or if your, con your URL fetch does not work. Pretty much the same thing here. Using a link tag, you can do the same thing. Uh, you run into the same problem, flash of unstyled content. OK, now, constructible style sheets are actually really exciting. Um, it's quickly making its way into the mainstream. So these make it possible to define and prepare shared styles and apply them to multiple shadow roots easily and without duplication. So should you want to make a client-side update to a shared style sheet, it actually gets applied to every root that has chosen to adopt it. And adopting a style sheet is fast and, and synchronous once the sheet has been loaded. So I mean, I'm definitely looking forward to learning a lot more about the ins and outs of this approach. So web components are an ideal solution for large design system implementations that need to support accessible, functional experiences across multiple brand identities. They help systems builders, systems builders strike a balance between control and access. So when building com web components, you're considering not just the user experience, but the developer experience as well. And this involves architecting consistent and well-documented API and communicating, 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 often and early. Frameworks. Web components are a set of browser specifications. Th they can be built using libraries like lit, but they are not a framework by themselves. They can certainly enable you to build an application without a framework, but they can also facilitate development in environments with disparate framework use. Joining a large company like Red Hat or Adobe, you don't really get to immediately tell your boss's boss that they have to completely reorganize their teams. I may I mean, like, you may have that kind of professional capital, but like, I do not. So my philosophy is, we do the best with what we've got. We move on. I, I had to answer the question, how do I provide a design systems implementation that works in raw HTML, React, Angular, Vue, Preact, and that's just at Red Hat. We needed a solution that was unopinionated and standards-based, that couldn't be implemented incorrectly, and was accessible by default, especially for teams that might be skimming over the documentation or skipping the extras because they think it doesn't matter. I needed a way to support several different brand identities while serving the user's need for consistency. They needed to feel like they were moving through a family of sites and not a grab bag of unrelated things. And Web Components was that solution for us. So maybe it can be for you, too. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Cassandra. I'll give ah. you a minute to hop on. <laughs> hop indeed. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we are a little over time, so we just have time for one question, but I think this is a good one. <laughs> um, what is the current state of server-side rendering web components? Yes, you should talk to Justin Fagnani. Um, I am not a JS expert, so that is not my forte, but I will say uh, Lit has been doing some really cool um, labs. They call them experiments. Uh, SSR uh, is a big target for them. Um, I've also seen uh, Eleventy has done some cool stuff with server-side rendering of web components. Nice. Again, I think like, we've got lots of Eleventy fans in the room. I'm not <laughs> a I'm not a back-end person, but like, it's it sounds like it's really exciting stuff. Okay, well, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, picking your brains. <laughs> I, I also have lots of questions about web components, but yes, we unfortunately don't have any uh, time. No, for thank them you right for now. your patience. <laughs> um, Cassandra will be at the help desk um, during the break shortly. Um, so, yeah, we are going to uh, head off on a break. Oh, thank you very much, Cassandra. Can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> thank you.